Your Excellency, thank you very much for talking to us on the world. Um, what is your reading of the results so far? Are they a surprise to you? Um, I would not look, I mean, cephalogists come up with numbers and exit polls come up with numbers. But I think the main thing is, if you look at the trend line of elections, this is broadly in line with what democracy in India is all about, which is that people speak, they have a voice. And contrary to a lot of what has been said about uh, elections in India, people have a very clear way of expressing their views. So in a sense, it's a strong reaffirmation of the, f the faith people have in the power of uh, being a citizen and being able to go out and vote. I think individual political parties will make, uh, make their own statements about what the results mean for them. But I think the best summary I saw on TV, and it's not my own, is that this is a sense of both continuity and change at the same time. There are those who are saying that actually for the winning party this is a defeat because it's not achieved as much as, as it had hoped for, the BJP, and for the losing party it's a victory. Try and explain that to people who don't <laughs> understand in this very complicated politics. True. Uh, look, India, for your viewers, is a very large, very federal country and each of our constituent states have a certain number of seats in our equivalent to the House of Commons. We call it the People's House, Lok Sabha. Um, um, the election results uh, are uh, for 543 seats in the lower house, and the magic number is 272 seats. Um, prior to the election, two broad uh, political alliances were formed to contest the election. One is the uh, ruling party, the National uh, Democratic Alliance, NDA, and the other is uh, the acronym uh, in, uh, Indian National Democratic Alliance, uh, which is uh, INDIA, um, just to make things more complicated, so to speak. Mm. But essentially, either of the two alliances to be able to form government had to cross the magic number, 272. Now, in the last two elections, the NDA and its constituent parties had comfortably crossed that number, with the biggest party in that, the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, crossing the 272 mark on its own. The opposition alliance has uh, done better than the pollsters uh, suggested, uh, which, uh, which is, I suppose, the reason why people are saying, even though they may not form the government uh, as far as current indications suggest, they are still doing better than they had expected or that pollsters had expected of them. So in that sense, you have a situation which... In any other normal sense, you would say, why is everybody making, the fu making all the fuss about? Because one party or one group is coming to power for a third time, and the other party is done better than they expected, but they are in opposition. I think that's the good bit of democracy that you have, uh, even in an election that is for the current ruling party, the third uh, term in office, it is still clearly a contested election. And particularly because Narendra Modi is seen as this sort of unassailable titan of Indian politics. His party had, I think, aspired to 400 seats. It's fallen well short of that. I mean, do you think that outcome is a kind of rejection of what is seen as the kind of Modi personality cult as it's been I, reported to be? Well, you know, you know, I think it's too early to get into uh, to assessments of what each individual result actually means. I mean, in a sense... These results will need to be disaggregated across the length and breadth of the country. In some states, uh, I would say the current ruling party has done better than they expected. In some states, they've not done as well as they expected. So across the country, you get a somewhat mixed picture. But I think the important point is, uh, you know, for people who felt that uh, the result might either completely change or that it would be an um, extrapolation of the previous trend, it shows that the Indian voter has uh, a different view of how to do, how to, how to convey a mandate to the government. It has conveyed a mandate for the same government, but it has truncated it in some degree, and that's democracy. So it's a kind of democratic correction, I suppose, in some ways. And, and Modi has been criticised for some of the rather controversial comments he's made in this campaign, referring to Muslims as infiltrators and those who have more children, a sort of right-wing Islamophobic trope, those... Uh, critics would say, as an ambassador here, do you ha is it difficult for you to defend those kind of comments? Well, look, um, frankly, these are political comments, and we don't get asked as uh, as diplomats to get into the p politics of things, which is about right. Uh, but I would only refer people to what the Prime Minister himself said in his uh, interviews 
to media when he was asked exactly these questions. And he said he was responding to what was in the mandates of the opposition parties. Now, I neither, I neither know nor want to get into the political uh, rhetoric on either side. But I do know that in all our governments, historically, since our independence, all development work is done for all people. There, is, there has never been a situation where we try and say, this bit of work, you know, the addition of water supply, the addition of electric, electric power supply, uh, the creation of sanitation for all, is in any way loaded against any one community. It is for all. So the developmental experience in India is about all communities. Politics is a space which, fortunately, as a civil servant, I don't need to go to. And I leave it to political interpreters to explain or not explain uh, politics. But I do know that the Prime Minister made a fairly, uh, fairly robust defense of the fact that he has also sought to govern for all when he said that I, uh, I look for, as he put it, sabka saath, sabka vikas, which translated means uh, the benefit of all and for all. He also said that um, God had sent him and the kind of energy he possesses cannot come from a biological body. <laughs> Can you explain that at all to, to British viewers? Well, look, uh, I think in India and in the Indian tradition, I think the idea of uh, being, being imbued by, by, by God is part of our traditional culture. I don't think he was trying to say that he has a specific... Uh, divinity attached to himself. He's not divinely ordained. No, I don't think he was trying to say that. He was trying to say that he feels that he has, he treats this as a religious mission to try and uh, lift India up, which, fair enough. I mean, uh, lots of our politicians have talked in terms that have uh, divinity and politics all attached together. It's, I don't, I don't want to get into uh, either religion or politics, but I think his def defense of what he said was fairly clear, that I'm not saying I'm divinely ordained. I'm saying that this is a mission that I feel charged about. And what do you think the new government as its form, what does that mean for India's place in the world and its foreign policy, do you think, particularly in relation to relations with Britain? Well, look, as far as we're concerned, I think uh, we have the good fortune of looking at the India-UK relationship from a bipartisan space. Uh, all our major political parties have long been invested in the idea of strong ties with Britain. In fact, uh, both uh, the BJP government and the previous government, uh, broadly the Congress coalition, was very keen on stepping up uh, our strategic partnership with the UK. Uh, and if I look at the trend line of the last 20 years, I can see successive prime ministers, we've had three in the last 24 years, have all tried to build this partnership. So I'm confident that in an international relations space, uh, the government of India will continue to lean into its international partnerships. We see uh, the importance of the external sector, whether it's trade or, uh, you know, partnerships with, in defense or partnerships in technology as being central to India reaching its goal of being a developed country by 2047. It's a massive exercise having a, an election in a democracy as big as, as India's. 44 days of polling, I think. <laughs> I mean, yes. I think um, billions spent by all sides on, on campaigning. But the, the real challenge this year has been the heat, this extraordinary <laughs> yes. heat wave. I mean, how worried are you by that? And does it, is it a sign that climate change is really badly affecting India? And that, is that a sign of things to come? Well, look, we have been very clear, uh, successive governments, in particular the current Prime Minister, have spoken at length about how important it is for India to have a much more active stance on working towards reducing the impact of uh, the anthropomorphic impact on the climate and to come up with solutions for India to uh, make the green transition. As your critics say you're not doing enough, I and mean, we, inter we interviewed a, an activist yesterday who was actually arrested and detained for some time because she had campaigned simply uh, for better environmental considerations by the government. I mean, are you, are you doing enough to deal with this threat, do you think? Well, frankly, we're doing more than most. Uh, we are already the third largest generator of solar power, uh, considering where we were even eight or nine years ago. We're already way ahead of most others. We achieved our Paris commitments seven years ahead of schedule, and we've, uh, we've already agreed to step that up further. Now, in terms of green power, absolutely. In terms of moving towards transportation, green transportation, we've had some of the biggest rollouts of electric buses anywhere in the world. A lot of coal-fired power still. Yes, but look, this is a country in which we still have need for people to have uh, access to affordable power. You know, we don't have the luxury of being able to say, let's just transition out when alternative technologies cost us so much more. We are ourselves looking to cut back on, on coal power. But frankly, if I may point out, a lot of our Western friends 
have also changed their own targets about phasing out coal power when, when the access to alternative sources changed in the last couple of years. After all, we have to do what is feasible within, within the size of our pocket uh, in terms of what is uh, affordable. Um, India does have, uh, has done a lot in pulling people out of poverty, but we still have to give people a better chance. It can't be either or. We have to have development. We have to have, give people a chance to access the modern economy through electric power, through running water, etc. But we also have to keep adding as much as we can to green power. And I believe no matter how the current government is formed, I believe this will remain an abiding commitment for India because more than anybody else, we don't need to be told that poorer people, countries in the global south, are the larger victims of climate change. We fully understand that. What lesson do you think the election has for your rivals, particularly your autocratic rivals like China? I mean, concerns about the authoritarian direction of Narendra Modi's government. It is a huge success democratically, this election. What kind of signal, what message does it send to people, to countries like China? Well, first of all, I'd say it sends a signal to everybody, including uh, some of our friends in the international media who were sort of suggesting that democracy is dead or that electronic voting machines somehow don't work. I think you have stark proof that democracy in India is alive and well, that everything we've been saying for the last 20 years, is that we really have this down to a gold standard, that Indian elections work, the people's mandate is accurately captured, that Indian democracy is robust. All of this is true. And I think to the larger world, it also conveys the point that in India, because we have democracy, we, we, we have the bedrock for development. It isn't the other way around. Development, we have never put development ahead of democracy. Let me make this point, and I think your viewers would, would be surprised to know this. We are the only country in the world, and I will say this with, with great pride, that became a democracy in conditions of complete and abject poverty in 1947. After our independence, 90% of the population lived below, below the poverty line. No other democracy in the world, not even in the advanced countries, became a democracy at, at moments of poverty, a full democracy, in the sense that every citizen, man, woman, and child, not child, but over, over 18, had the opportunity to select a government. No other country in the world did that. So I think our election today shows that democracy is still the best way forward for all developing countries. One very important election still to come in a year of elections in America. If Donald Trump is elected, do you think Narendra Modi is looking forward to working with him? One strong man working alongside another. Is he going to welcome Donald Trump's victory, do you think? Look, we have, as I have said, just as we have a bipartisan approach to the, uh, to the uh, UK, we have had the most excellent bipartisan relationship with the US for the last since the early 2000s, you know, whether it was the Democrats in power or the Republican Party in power. And we see that this is based on fundamental uh, coincidence of both interests and values. And for us, that's the most important thing. The American people will get to decide who runs America. We're not espousing a view whether we like, uh, you know, a candidate or the other candidate. Uh, and once the American people have spoken, we will work as closely as we can with our American partners, whoever runs America. Thank you very much. Thank you for Good having to talk me. to you.